Ars Poetica, by Quintus Horatius Flaccus, read for LibriVox.org, by Leni. Humano capiti quer vicem pictore quinam, jungere si velit it varias inducere plumas, undique colatis membris ut turpiteratrum tessinat, in piscem mulier formosa superne, spectatum admissi risum teneatis amici, credite pisones isti tabulae fore librum per similem cuius velut aegri somnia vanae, fingentur species ut nec pes nec caput uni redatur formae. Pictoribus atque poetis quid libet audendi semper fuit aequa potestas. Scimus et hanqueniam petimusque damusque vicissim, sed non ut placidis coian imitia non ut serpentes avibus geminentur tigribus agni. Inceptis grauibus plerumque magna professis purpureus, la te qui splende ad unus et alter, ad suitur panus, cum lucus et ara dianae, et properantis aquae per amoinus sambitus agros, aut flumen renum aut tuius describitur arcus, sed nunc non erat his locus, et fortasse cupressum scissimulare, quid hoc sit fractis enata ad expes nauibus aere dato qui pingitur, amphora coipid institui currente rota cur urceus exit, denique sit quod vis simplex dum taxat et unum. Maxima pars vatum pater et juvenes patre digni, decipimur specie recti, brevis esse laboro, obscurus fio, sectantem leui a nervi, deficiunt animique, professus grandi a turged, serpit humi tutus nimium timidusque procelae, qui variare cupit rem prodigia literunam, delfinum silvis ad pingit fluctibus aprum. Invitium ducit cupae fugasi caret arte, Aemilium circa ludum faver imus et unguis, exprimet et mollis imitabitur aere capillos, in felix operis summa, qui aponere totum nesciet, hunc ego me si quid componere curem, non magis esse velim quam naso vivere prao, spectandum nigris oculis nigroque capillo. Summite materiam vestris, qui scribitis aequam viribus, et versate diu quid ferre recusen, quid valeant umeri. Qui lecta potente reri tres, nec facundia deseret unc, nec lucidus ordo. Ordinis haec virtus erit et venus aut ego fallor, ut iam nunc dicat, iam nunc de bentia dici. Plera que differat et praesens in tempus omitat, hoc amet, hoc spernat promissi carminis auctor. In verbis etiam tenuis cautusque serendis, dixeris e gregie, notum sicali da verbum redidedit iunctura novum. Si forte recesses indiciis monstrare recentibus abdita reret, Fingere quinctutis non exaudita que fegis, contingiet dabitur que licenti e sumpta pudenter, et nova ficta que nu per habebum duerba fidemsi, graico fonte cadent parque de torta, quid autem caecilio pauto que dabit romanus, ademptum vergilio varioque. Ego cur ad quirere pauca, Si possum in videor cum lingua catonis et eni, sermonem patrium ditaverit et nova rerum, nomina pro tulerit. Licuit semper que licebit, signatum praesente nota pro ducere nomen. Ut silvae foliis pronos mutantur in anos, prima cadunt, 
ita verborum vetus interit aitas, et juvenum ritu florent, modo nata vigentque. Debemur morti nos nostraque, si vereceptus terra neptunus classes aquilonibus arcer, regis opus sterilis veudiu, palus apta que remis, vicinas urbes alit et graue senti taratrum. Seu cursum mutau et iniquum frugibus amnis, doctus iter melius mortali a facta peribunt, ne dum sermonenstet honoset gratia vivax. Multa are nascentur quaiam cecidere cadentque, quae nunc sunt in honore vocabula si volet usus, quem penes arbitrium est et ius et norma loquendi. Resges tae regnumque ducumque tristia bella, quos scribi possent numero monstrauit homerus, versibus in parite iuntis querimonia primum, post etiam inclusest voti sententia compos, quis tamen exibuos elegos e miserit auctor, grammatici certant, et ad hoc subiudice lisest. Archilocum proprio rabies armauit iambo. Hunc soci cepere pedem grandesque coturni, alternis aptum sermonibus et popularis, vincentem strepitus et natum rebus agendis. Musa dedit filibus divos puerosque deorum, et pugilem victore te quom certamine primum, et juvenum curas, et libera vinna refere. Discriptas servare vices operumque colores, cur ego si neque o ignoroque poeta salutor, cur nescire pudens praue quam discere malo, quercibus exponi tragicis rescomica non vult. Indignatur item privatis ac propresoco, dignis carminibus narrari cena fiestae, singula quae quelocum teneam sortita decentem. Interdum tamen et vocem comoidia tolit, iratusque cremes tumido de litigat ore, et tragicus plerumque dolet sermone pedestri. Telefus et peleus cum pauper et exuluterque, proicit ampulas et sesquipedalia verba, si curat cor spectantis detigisse querella. Non satis es pulcresse poemata, dulci assunto, et quocumque volent animum auditoris agunto. Ut ridentibus ad rident, Ita flentibus ad sunt humani voltus, si visme flere dolendes primipsi tibi, tum tua me infortunia laident, tele fevel peleu, male si mandata loqueris, aut dormitab aut ridebo, tristia maestum, voltum verba decent iratum plena minarum, Ludentem lasciva severum seria dictu. Forma tenim natura prius non intus ad omnem fortunar abitum. Iuat aut impelit ad iram, aut adumum maerore graui deducit et angit. Post effert animi motus interprete lingua. Si dicentis erunt fortunis absona dicta, Romani tolent equites perites quecacinum. Interedit multum, divos ne loquatur anheros, Maturus ne senexan ad hoc florente juventa fervidus, Et matrona potens ansedula nutrix. Mercator ne vagus cultor ne virentis ageli, Colcus an Assirius sebis nutritus an argis. Aut famam sequer aut sibi convenienti a finge scriptor, Honoratum si forte reponis Achillem, 
impinger ira kundus inexorabilis aker, iura neget sibi nata, nihil non aroget armis, sit medea ferox invictaque, flebilis inno, perfidus ixion, io vaga tristis orestes, si quid in expertum scainae comitis et audes, personam formare novam, servetura dimum, qualis ab incepto processerit et sibi consted, difficil est proprie comunia dicere tuque, rectius ilia cum carmen de ducis in actus, quam si profere sig not indicta que primus. Publica materies privati iuris eritsi, non circa willem patulumque morabere sorbem, nec verbo verbum curabis redere fidus, interpres nec desirie civitator in artum, unde pedem profere pudor, wetet aut operis lex. Nec sic incipies ut scriptor ciclicus olem, Fortunam priami cantabet nobile bellum. Quid dignum tanto feret hic promissor hiatu? Parturient montes, nascetu ridiculus mus. Quanto rectius hic, qui nil molitur inepte. Dic mihi musa virum captae post tempora Troiae, qui mores hominum multorum vidit et urbes. Non fumum ex fulgore, sed ex fumo dare lucem, cogitat, ut speciosa dehinc miracula promat, antifatem sci lamquet cum ci clope caribdim. Nec reditum dio medis ab interitu meleagri, nec gemino bellum troian ordittur aboo, semper adeventum festinat et in medias res, non secus ac notas, auditorem rapid, et quae despera tractata ni tescere posse relinquit, ad quita mentitur sic veris falsa remiscit, primo ne medium, medio ne discrepetimum. Tu qui deget populus mecum desideret audi, si plosoris eges aulae amanentis et usque, se suri donec cantor, vos plaudite dicat. Aetatis cui usque notandi, sum tibi mores, mobilibusque decor naturis dandus et anis, redere qui voces iam scit pueret pedecerto, signat humum, gestit paribus con ludere tiram, Colligit ac ponite meret mutatur in horas. In verbus juvenis tandem custode remoto, Gaudet equis canibus quet aprici gramine campi, Cereus in vitium flecti, monitoribus asper, Utilium tardus provisor prodigus aeris, Sublimis cupidus quet amata relinquere pernix. Conversis studiis aetas animusque virilis, quaerit opes et amicitias in servit honori, comisis e gauet quod mox mutare laboret, multa senem circum veniunt incomoda vel quod, quaerit et inventis miser abstinet actimet uti, vel quod res omnis timide gelide que ministrat, dilator, sve longus, iners avidusque futuri, difficilis querulus laudator temporis acti, se puero castigator censorque minorum. Multa ferunt ani venientes comoda secum, multa recedentes adimunt, ne fortes eniles mandentur iueni partes pueroque viriles, semper in adiuntis ae voque morabitur aptis. Aut agitur res in scainis aut acta refertur. Segnius in ritant animos de missa per aurem, 
quam quae sunt oculis subiecta fidelibus et quae ipse sibi tradit spectator, non tamen intus digna geri promes in scaina multa quetoles ex oculis, quae mox narret facundi apraesens. Ne pueros coram populo medea trucidet, aut humana palam coquat exta nefarius atreus, aut in auem procne vertatur cadmus in anguem, quod cum quos tendis mihi sic incredulus odi. Neu e minor neu sit quinto productior actu, fabula, quae posci volt et spectanda reponi, nec Deus in tersit nisi dignus windi que nodus inciderit, ne quarta loqui persona laboret. Actoris partis chorus o ficiunque virile defendat, neo quid medios in tercinat actus. Quod non proposito conducat et haereat apte, Ile bonis faueat quet concilietur amice, et regatiratos et amet pecare timentis. Ile da pes laudet mensae brevis, ille salubrem, justitiam leges quet apertis otia portis. Ile tegat comissa de iosque precetur et oret, ut rereat miseris, Abeat fortuna superbis. Tibia non ut nunc oricalco vincta tubaeque aimula, se tenui simplexque foramine pauco, ad spiraret ad desse choris erat utilis atque, non dum spisa nimis complere sedilia flatu, quos ane populus numerabilis ut pote parvos, et frugi castusque vere condusque coibat, posquam coipit agros extendere victor et urbes, latior amplecti murus vinoque diurno, placari genius festis impune diebus, acessit numerisque modisque licentia maior. In doctus quidenim saper et liberque laborum, rusticus urbano, confusus, turpis honesto. Sic prisca emotumque et luxuri emadi tirarti, tibi quen traxit quevagus per pulpita westem. Sic etiam fidibus voces creuere seueris, et tulit e loquim insolitum facundia praeceps, utiliumque sagax reret divina futuri, sortilegis non discrepuit sententia delfis. Carmine qui tragico villem certavit obircum, moxetia agrestis satiros nudavit et asper, in columi gravitate iocum tentavit eo quod in celebris erat et grata novitate morandus, spectator functusque sacris et potus et exlex. Verit a risores ita comendare licacis, conueni et satiros, ita vertere seria ludo. Ne qui cumque deus qui cum quadibebit urheros, regali conspectus in auro nupere rostro, migret in obscuras humilis sermone tabernas, aut dum vita tumum nubes et tinania captet. E futire levis indigna tragoidia versus, ut festis matrona moveri iussa diebus, in tererit satiris paulum pudibunda protervis. Non eginornate dominantia nomina solum, verba que pisones satirorum scriptor amabo, nec sic enitar tragico difere colori, ut nihil intersit daus ne loquatur et audax, pifias e muncto lucrata simone talentum, an custos famulusque deis illenus alumni. Ex noto fictum carmen sequar, ut sibiquivis speret idem sudet multum frustraque laboret, Aussus idem, 
tantum series juntur aque polet, tantum de medio sumptis acedit honoris. Si luis de ducti caueant me iudice fauni, ne velut inati triuis ac paine forenses, aut nibium teneris juvenentur versibus unquam, aut in munda crepent, ignominiosa quedita. Ofenduntur enim quibus est equoset pater etres, nec si quid fricti ciceris probat et nucisemptor, aequis a cipium tanimis donantue corona. Si laba longa brevis subiecta vocat uriambus. Pescitus, un detiam trimetris ad crescere iusit, nomen iam beis, cum senos rederet ictus, primus ad extremum similis sibi, non ita pridem, tardior ut paulo grauior que veniret ad auris, spondeo stabilis in iura paterna recepit, comodus et patiens, non ut de sede secunda, cederet, aut quarta socialiter, hic et in aci, nobilibus trimetris ad paret rarus, et eni, in scaina missos cum magno pondere versus, aut operae ce leris nimium curaque carentis, aut ignoratae premit artis crimine turpi. Non qui vis videt in modulata poema ta iudex, et data romanis veni est indigna poetis. Id circone vager scribam quelicenter, an omnis visuros pecata putem mea tutus ed intra, spem veni ae cautus. Vi tau idenique culpam, non laudem merui, vos exemplaria graica, nocturna versate manu, versate diurna. At vestri proavi plautinos et numeros et laudavere sales, nimi un patienter utrunque, ne dicam stulte, mirati si modegetuos, scimus in urbanum lepido se ponere dicto, legitimumque sonum digitis calemus et aure. Ignotum tragicae genus invenisse camenae, dicitur et claustris vexisse poemata thespis, quae canerent agerentque perunti faecibus ora. Post hum personae palaeque repertor honestae, aescilus et modicis instrauit pulpita tignis, et docuit magnumque loquinitique coturno. Succesit vetus his comoedia non sine multa laude, sed in vitium libertas excidit et vim, dignam lege regi, lex est accepta corusque, turpiter opticuit sub lato iure nocendi. Nil intemptatum nostri liquere poetae, nec minimum meruere decus vestigia graica, Ausi deserere celebrare domestica facta, Vel qui prae textas, vel qui docuere togatas. Nec virtute foret clarisue potentius armis, Quam lingua latium si non offenderet unum, Quemque poetarum limae laboret mora, Vos o pompilio sanguis, Carmen reprehendite, quod non multa dies et multa litura coercuit, atque praesectum deciens non casti gauit adunguem. In genium misera quia fortunatius arte, credit et excludit sanos helicone poetas, democritus, bona pars non unguis ponere curat, non barbam secreta petit loca balnea vitat. Non quisquetur enim pretium nomenque poetae, si tribus anticiris caput insanabile nunquam tonsori licino comiserit, o egolaibus, 
qui purgor bilem subverni temporis horam. Non alius faceret meliora poemata, verum nil tantest, ergo fungar wicecotis acutum, redere quae ferrum valet exors ipsa secandi, munus et officium nil scribens ipse docebo, unde parentur opes quid alat formetque poetam, quid deceat, quid non, quo virtus, quo fera terror. Scribendi recte saperest et principi et fons, rem tibi Socraticae poterunt ostendere cartae, verbaque provisam ren non in vita sequentur. Quidi dicit patriae, quid debeat et quid amicis, quos sit amore parens, quo frater amandus et hospes, quod sit conscripti, quod judicis officium, quae partes in bellum isi ducis ille profecto, redere personae scit convenienti acuique, respicer exemplar vitae morumque iubebo, docti mitatoret vivas hinducere voces. Interdum speciosa locis moratacque recte, Fabula nullius veneris sine ponderet arte, Valdius oblectat populum meliusque moratur, Quam versus in nopes rerum nugaeque canorae. Grais ingenium, grais dedit ore rotundo, Musa loqui praeter laudem nullius avaris, Romani pueri longis rationibus assem, Discunt in partis centum di ducere, dicat filius albini, si de quincuncere motest, uncia, quid superat? Poteras di sisetriens, eu, rem poteris servare tuam, redit uncia quid fit, semis, an haec animos aeruget cura peculi, cum semel imbuerit speramus carmina fingi, posse linenda cedro et lewi servanda cupresso? Aut prodesse volunt aut delectare poetae, aut simul et iucundet idonea dicere vitae. Quid quid praecipies, esto brevis ut cito dicta, per cipiant animi dociles teneantque fidelis. Omne super vacuum pleno de pectore manat. Ficta voluptatis causa sin proxima veris, ne cod cumque volet poscat sibi fabula credi, ne uprançai lamiae vivum puer extra hataluo. Centuriae senior agitant expertia frugis, celsi praetereunt austera poema taramnes. Omne tulit punctum qui miscuit utile dulci, lectorem delectando pariterque monendo. Hic meret aera liber sosiis, hic et mare transit, et longum noto scriptori prorogat aevum. Sunt delicta tamen, qui vos igno visse velimus. Nam neque corda sonum redit quem volt manus et mens, poscentique grauem per saipe remitit acutum, nec semper feriet quod cumque minabitur arcus. Quer ubi plura nitent in carmine, non ego paucis offendar maculis, quas aut in curia fudit, aut humana parum cauit natura. Quid ergest? Ut scriptor si peccat idem librarius usque, quam vis es monitus venia caret et chitaroidus, ridetur, corda qui sempre robera te adem, sic mihi qui multum cessat fit coirilus ille, quem bis terque bonum cum riso miror et idem, indignor quandoque bonus dormitat homerus, Quer operi longo fas est ob repere somnum. Ut pictura poesis, 
eriquai si propius tes, te capiat magis et quaidam si longius abstes, haec amat obscurum, valet haec sub luce videri, iudicis argutum quae non formidat acumen, haec placuit semel, haec deciens repetita placebit. O maior iuenum, quam visit voce paterna, fingeris ad recte per te sapis hoc tibi dictum, tolle memor certis merie tolerabile rebus, recte concedi, consultus iuris et actor, causarum mediocris abest virtute disserti, me salae nex quit quantum cascelius aulus, sed tamen in preti est, mediocribus esse poetis, non homines non di non concessere columnae. Ut gratas inter mensa symphonia discors, et crassum guentet sardo cum mele papauer, offendunt, poterat duci cui acena sinistis, sic animis natum inventumque poema iuandis, si paulum sumo de cessit vergit adimum. Ludere qui nescit campestribus abstinet armis, in doctusque pilae disciu et rociue qui escit, nespissae risum tollant in pune coronae, qui nescit versus tamen audet fingere, qui nescit versus tamen audet fingere, quidni, liberet in genuus frae certim census equestrem, summam numorum vitioque remotus abomni. Tu nihil in vita dices faciesue minerva, id tibi iu dici est eamens, si quid tamen olim, scripseris, in maici descendat iu dicis auris, et patris et nostras, non nunque prematur in anum, membranis intus positis, de lere licebit, quod non erideris, nescit vox missa reverti. Silvestris homines sacer interpresque deorum, caedibus et victu foido de teru et orfeus. Dictus ob hoc lenire tigris rabidosque leones, dictus et amphion, thebanae conditor urbis, saxa muere sono testudinis de preque blanda, ducere quo velet, fuit haec sapientia quondam, publica privatis se cernere sacra profanis, concubitu prohibere vago, dare iura maritis, opida moliri, leges inquidere ligno. Sic honoret nomen divinis vatibus aque, carminibus venit, post hos insignis homerus, Tirtae usque mares animos in martia bella, versibus exacuit, dictae per carmina sortes, et vitae monstrata vi est, et gratia regum pieriis temptata modis ludusque repertus, et longorum operum finis, ne forte pudori, si tibi musa alirae soler set cantor Apollo. Natura fieret laudabile carmen an arte, quaesi test, ego nec studium sine divit e vena, nec rude quid prositui deo ingenium, altera poscit opem res et coniurat amice, qui studet optatam cursu contingere metam, multa tulit fe quitque puer, su dauit et alsit, abstinuit venerit vino, Qui pitia cantat, tibi quen didicit prius extimuit que magistrum. Nunc satis est, dixisse, ego mira poema tapango, ocupet extremum scabies, mihi turpe relinquest, et quod non didici, sane nescire fateri. Ud praeca ad merces turbam qui cogit emendas, ad sentatores iubet ad lucrire poeta, dives agris, dives positis in fenore numis. 
si ueres tumtum qui recte ponere possit, et spondere lewi pro paupere teri per atris litibus implicitum mirabor sisci et inter, nos queremendacem verunque beatus amicum. Tu seu donari seu qui donare volescui, noli tod adversus tibi factos ducere plenum laetitiae, clamabi tenim, pucre bene recte, palesquet superhis, etiem stilabit amicis, ex oculis rorem saliet, tum det pedeterram, ut qui conducti plorant in funere dicunt, et faciunt prope plura dolentibus ex animo, sic derisor vero plus laudatore movetur. Reges di cuntur multis surgere culilis, et torquere mero quem perpexisse laborent, ansit amicitia dignus, si carmina condes, num quam te fallent animi sub volpe latentes. Quintilio si quid recitares corrige sodes, hoc aiebat et hoc melius te posse negares, bis terque expertum frustra, delere iubeba, et male tornatos in cudi redere versus, si defendere delictum quam vertere males, Nul ultra verba ut operin su me batinanem, quin sine riuali teque tua solus amares. Vir bonus et prudens versus reprehendet inertis, culpabit duros, in contis ad linet atrum, transforso calamo signam bitiosa recidet, ornamenta parum claris lucem dare coget, Argo et ambigue dictum, mutanda notabit, fiet aristarcus, nec dicet, cur egamicum ofendim nugis, hae nugae seriae ducent, in mala de erisum semel exceptum que sinistre. Ut mala quem scabies aut morbus regius surget, aut fanaticus error et iracunda diana, que sanum tetigisse timent fugiunt que poetam, qui sapiunt, agitant puerin cautique secuntur, hic dum sublimis versus ructatur et errat, si veluti merulis intentus decidit auceps, in puteum foeam velicet, sucurite longum, clamet, io qui ues, non sit qui tolere curet, Si curet quis opem feret de mitere funem, quis quis an prudens huxe de iecerit atque seruari nolit, dicam, siculique poetae, narabo interitum, Deus in mortalis haberi, dum cupit empedocles ardentem frigidus aetnam in siluit, sit ius liceat que perire poetis, in vitum quis seruat, idem facit occidenti. Nec semel hoc fecit, nec si retractus eritiam, fiet homo et ponet famosae mortis amorem. Nec satis aparet cur versus factit et utrum, minxerit in patrios cineres antriste vidental, moverit in cestus certe furit ac velut ursus, Objectos caueae valuit si frangere clatros, in doctum doctum que fugat recitator a cerbus, que muerari pui tenet occidit que legendo, non misura cutem nisi plena cruori sirudo. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Art of Poetry, Part 1, by Quintus Horatius Flaccus, translated by Mason and Watt, read for LibriVox.org, by Lenny. Should a painter take upon him to join a horse's neck onto a human head, and to add plumage of diverse colors, limbs from every kind of animal, 
so that what in its upper parts was a fair woman ended in a foully hideous fish, would you, when admitted as a friend to a private view, be able to contain your laughter? Believe me, Pisos, very like that picture will a book be wherein conceptions are imagined false as a sick man's dreams, wherein neither head nor foot can be referred to a single type. But painters and poets alike have always been allowed any license they choose. We know it, and we mutually give and take the privilege, but on condition that there are no matches made between wild and tame, no pairing of birds with serpents, or of lambs with tigers. Often to openings in the grand style that promise much are tacked on one or two brilliant patches to add a far-seen luster, and when the grove and altar of Diana, the meandering of the water as it hurries through the pleasant meadows, the river Rhine, or the rainbow is described, but this was not the place for them. Perhaps you know how to paint a cypress, but what's the use if the man who has paid for his portrait is swimming away in despair after a shipwreck? It was a jar that was begun. Why, as the wheel runs, is the outcome a ewer? In fine, let it be what you please, provided it is one thing, natural. We poets, for the most part, father and young man worthy of your father, are the victims of our own ideals. I labor to be short and become obscure. While I pursue smoothness, my work lacks vigor and spirits. The poet who aims at sublimity becomes bombastic, while he who is too cautious and too fearful of the storm crawls on the ground. The painter who desires to vary unnaturally a single subject puts a dolphin in the woods, a boar amid the waves. Thus the shunning of one fault, if it lacks skill, leads to another. The humblest craftsman about the Emilian school can copy fingernails and imitate flowing hair in bronze, yet miss success in his work at large because he cannot represent a whole. If I cared to write, I would not be he, any more than I would go through life with an ugly nose while my black eyes and black hair commanded admiration. You who write, take a theme suited to your strength, and ponder long what burden your shoulders will not bear and what they can. The man who chooses his subject with self-restraint, him neither eloquence nor clear arrangement will forsake. The virtue and the beauty of arrangement, or I am much mistaken, will prove to lie in this, to say at the very moment what at the very moment should be said, and to put off, and for the time leave out, much. He also who takes upon himself to promise a poem, nice and cautious in the connecting of his words, should hold to one and reject another. Your style will have distinction, if a skillful setting makes a well-known word new. If perchance it is needful by fresh signs to point to things before unknown, it will be your fortune to invent words which the setegi with their loin clothes never heard, and the freedom will be allowed you if modestly assumed. Your fresh and newly made words too will pass current if they come but sparingly drawn off from a Greek source. For what will the Romans grant to Sicilius and Plotus and refuse to Virgil and Varius? For my part, if I can gain a word or two, why should the right be grudged me? when the language of Cato and of Ennius enriched their country's speech, and brought in new names for new things. It has been allowed, and will for ever be allowed, to utter coin that bears the stamp of present use. As the woods change their leaves each swiftly moving year, and the first fall, so the older generation of words dies out, and, like young men, the newly born are fresh and strong. Death claims us, and all that is ours. Whether it be that, received within the land, Natum protects fleets from the north wind, a kingly work, or a marsh long barren, fit only for the oar, feeds neighboring cities, and feels the weight of the plough, or if a stream has changed a course that harmed the crops, learning a better way. Yet human works will perish, far less will the respect and popularity of speech be lasting. Many words already dead will find a second birth. Many will die that now are held in honor, if custom, in whose hands rest the power, the law, the rule, that governs speaking, so determine. 
It was Homer who showed in what measure the prowess of kings and leaders and stern wars could be described. In pairs of verses of an equal length, first sorrow, then the feeling of granted prayers was contained. But as to who invented and sent forth upon the world slight elegies, professors disagree, and the issue is still before the court. Archilochus was armed by his fury with the iambas of his own finding. Then comic sock and stately busking took up the foot, well suited as it was for dialogue, able to rise above the noise of the audience and born for action. The muse granted to the lyre to celebrate gods and their sons, the conquering boxer and the horse first in the race, the passions of youth and careless wine. But if I lack the power or the knowledge to keep to the accepted types and tones of poetic works, why am I hailed poet? Why do I, with false modesty, choose rather to be ignorant than to learn? A comic theme will not endure to be set forth in tragic verse, and Thyestes' banquet is outraged if it be told in the everyday strains that are almost worthy of the sock. Let each kind keep to its appointed and becoming place. Yet sometimes even comedy uplifts her voice, and angry creams declaims with swelling uterance, and often tragic characters bewail themselves in homely speech, as when Telephus and Peleus, beggars and exiles both, cast away their paint-pots and their words a foot and a half long, if the object of their plaint is to touch the heart of the spectator. It is not enough for poems to be beautiful, they must be pleasing, and draw the spirit of the beholder whithersoever they will. As faces that are human laugh with those who laugh, so they weep with those who weep. If you would have me weep, first you must grieve yourself, then your misfortunes will pain me, Telephus or Peleus. But if your words are ill-suited to your part, I shall doze or laugh. Sad words become a mournful character, threatening words and angry, sportive, a playful, grave, a stern. For nature first molds us within, according to every state of our fortunes. She makes us feel delight, or provokes us to wrath, or bows us to the earth beneath a weight of sorrow, and wrings our hearts. Tis only afterwards that she brings feeling to light by the interpretation of the tongue. If the words are out of tune with the fortunes of him who speaks them, the Romans, horse and foot, will raise a laugh. It will make all the difference whether a god or a hero is talking, an old man of ripe age, or one that is fiery, and still in the flower of his youth, the respected mistress of a household or a careful nurse, a wandering merchant or a tiller of green fields, Colchian or a Syrian, one that was reared in Argos or in Thebes. Follow tradition when you write, or invent consistent characters. If once more you should by chance present illustrious Achilles, let him be active, swift to wrath, implacable and fierce. Let him deny that laws were made for him, and claim all things for the sword. Let Medea be proud and unbending, Inno, tearful, Ixion, treacherous, Io, a wanderer, Orestes, gloomy. If you put upon the stage something not tried before, and have the courage to create a new character, let him be kept to the end just what he was when he first came on, and be consistent. Tis hard to endow commonplaces with the speaker's personality, and it would do better merely to divide the Iliad into acts than be first to produce unknown and untold incidents. The subject which is common property will be your personal possession if you do not remain in the cheap and easy round, and are not anxious, faithfully interpreting, to render word by word, nor in your imitation leap into a narrow place whence shame or the conditions of your work would forbid you to come forth. Nor will you begin, as once did a cyclic poet, of Priam's fortune will I sing and the famous war, what could this man of promises produce worthy of such mouthing? The mountains will be in labor, and the birth a miserable mouse. How far more rightly he, in all whose undertakings, there is judgment. Tell me, muse, of the hero, who, after the day of Troy's fall, beheld the manners and cities of many men. His plan is not to let his brilliance end in smoke, but from smoke to give light that one by one he may call forth his striking wonders, Antiphates and Scylla, the Cyclops and Charybdis. 
nor does he begin the story of Diomedes' return at the death of Miliagor, nor the Trojan war at the double egg. Always he hastens to the issue, and hurries the hearer into the midst of events, as though they were known, and what he cannot hope to make brilliant by his handling, he passes by. Moreover, he lies in such a fashion, and so mixes false with true, that the middle is not at variance with the beginning, nor the end with the middle. As for you, hear what I and the people with me look for, if you wish for applauding spectators who will wait for the curtain and sit till the singer says, Now clap. You must take note of the habits of every age, and assign to changeable and ripe ears their fitting character. The boy who has learned to answer, and sets a firm step on the ground, is eager to play with his fellows, and easily gathers and lays aside his anger, and changes from hour to hour. The beardless youth, his guardian at last removed, finds pleasure in horses and dogs and the grass of the sunny plain, walks to be moulded to wrongdoing, rude to his advisers, slow to secure his true interests, lavish of his money, enthusiastic, passionate, and swift to abandon what he loves. With changed pursuits, the age and spirit of the man seeks wealth and friendships, and is the slave of office. He fears to make the mistake which soon he may labor to undo. Many are the evils which surround an old man, either because he seeks, yet to his sorrow fears, to grasp and use what he has found, or because he manages all affairs fearfully and coldly, a procrastinator, with far-reaching hopes, inactive, eager for the days to come, cross-grained and querulous, one that praises the world as it went when he was a boy, and chides and criticizes younger men. Many pleasures the ears bring with them as they come, many as they go they take away. Lest you should give an old man's part to a young, or a man's part to a boy, know that we shall always dwell with pleasure on that which aptly fits each time of life. End of The Art of Poetry Part 1 This recording is in the public domain. The Art of Poetry Part 2 by Quintus Horatius Flaccus Translated by Mason and Watt Read for LibriVox.org by Lini Either the story is enacted upon the stage, or actions are reported. What enters by the ears stirs the feelings less deeply than that which is submitted to the faithful witness of the eyes, where the spectator is his own messenger. Nonetheless, we will not bring upon the stage what should be done within, and we will hide much from view, that in due course it may be told by the eloquence of an eyewitness. Let not Medea butcher her children before the world, or impious Atreus openly cook human flesh, or Procne turn into a bird, or Cadmus into a snake. Whatever of this kind you show me, unconvinced I hate. The play which hopes to be called for and once more brought to view upon the stage must not fall short of the fifth act, nor reach beyond it. Let no god intervene, unless there be a knot fit for a god to untie, and let no fourth character labor to speak. The chorus should take a share in the action, in a male part, and should sing no interludes between the acts that do not further the plot and fit it closely. It should support and give friendly counsel to the good, control the passionate, and love those who fear to sin. Let it praise the banquet of a frugal table, healthful justice, the laws, and peace with open gates. Let it keep secrets, and pray and implore the gods that fortune may return to the unhappy, and forsake the proud. Once the flute, not as now, bound with copper and challenging the trumpet, but low-voiced and of simple form and small opening, served to breathe harmony and support the choric song, and with its note to fill the theatre, as yet not too crowded. The either assembled a people that could well be numbered, for it was small, and it was sparing, pure, and modest. But when that people began by conquest to extend its territory, with its widening wall to embrace cities, when, without rebuke on a holiday, men comforted their souls by drinking by daylight, rhythm and harmony gained a greater freedom too. For, untaught and making holiday, what should they know of taste, countrymen and citizens mingled together, high and low? So it came that the flute-player added motion and wantonness to his former art, 
and trailed his robe as he roamed the stage. So, too, the sterner lyre gained notes, and headlong eloquence produced unwanted speech, and its utterances, wise to discern what was expedient and guess the future, differed not from those of oracular Delphi. The man who in tragic song contended for the poor prize of a he-goat soon, too, brought naked satires on the stage, and roughly tried his hand at jest, leaving dignity unharmed. For, by the vices and pleasing novelty, he had to hold the spectator, who had performed his sacrifice, and drunk, and was unbound by law. But while you strive to win approval for your laughters and witty satires, and mingle mirth and earnest, still it will not do that any god or any hero whom you call in, one who was but now seen in royal purple and gold, should, in his homely speech, adopt the tone of uncouth taverns, or, while he strives to shun the ground, strain cloud-high after windy language. Tragedy, that scorns to chatter frivolous lines, like a matron who is bidden to dance upon a holiday, will be modest, and mingle but little with wanton satires. It will not be mine, Pesos, when I write satire plays, to cling to plain names and common words alone, nor will I strive to be so far removed from the tone of tragedy that it will make no matter whether it be Davis who speaks in bold Pythias, enriched by the talent of which is swindled Simon, or Silenus, the guardian and servant of the god, his nursling. I will strive after language composed of well-known words, such that any one might hope for himself to attain, and should sweat much and toil in vain when he attempted it. Such is the power of order and context, so great the dignity that can be added to common words. If I were judge, the fawns that are summoned from the forest should have a care that they never, as though born in the alleys and almost denizens of the forum, trifled in too dainty verse, or shouted obscene and scurrilous words. For those who possess a horse, a father, and a competence take offence, nor even if the buyer of roast peas and nuts is inclined to approve, do they receive it favourably or crown the author. A long syllable, added to a short, is called an iambus, a rapid foot, and from its swiftness it bade the name trimeters attached itself to iambic lines, although the line had six beats, and from the first foot to the last was still the same. Not so long since, that it might strike the ear with something more of slowness and weight, being of a kindly and patient nature, it welcomed the steady spondeus into its ancestral realm, but still it would not yield to them as equals the second or the fourth foot. The iambus appears but rarely in the much-praised trimeters of Asius, and Aeneas's verses, launched with mighty weight upon the theatre, labor under the degrading charge of too rapid and careless work, or of an ignorance of art. Tis not every critic that can detect bad meter in verse, and an undeserved license has been granted to Roman poets. But for that, am I to break bounds and write loosely? Or shall I, thinking that all will see my faults, be on the safe side, and keep within the limits wherein I may hope for pardon? If I do so, I have escaped blame, but not earned praise. But do you, night and day, turn the leaves of your Greek models? You say your grandfathers praised the meter and the wit of Plautus. Their admiration of both was too forbearing, not to say foolish, if only you and I can distinguish a provincial joke from true wit, and can by the fingers and the ear detect the proper rhythm. Thespis is said to have discovered the form of tragic poetry, till then unknown, and to have carried in wagons his place for men to sing and act, their faces smeared with wine leaves. Next, Aeschylus, inventor of the mask and stately robe, built up the stage with narrow planks, and taught his actors to speak loud and stalk upon their buskin. After them came the old comedy, and won high praise, but freedom turned to license and to violence that needed to be checked by law. The law was passed, and, its right to injure gone, the chorus grew silent to its own disgrace. Our poets have left not untried, nor did they earn their smallest praise when such as wrote tragedies and comedies in Roman dress dare to leave the footmarks of the Greeks, and tell of native life. And Lachium had been no less famous for her literature than for her courage and illustrious arms, had not the labor of the file and expenditure of time 
been distasteful to all these poets. But do you, offspring of Pompilius, condemn any poem that many a day and many an erasure has not pruned and chastened ten times, till the pared nail detects no roughness? Because Democritus believes that genius is a better gift of fortune than humble art, and shuts out from Helicon such poets as are sane, no small number of them are not at the pains to cut their nails or beards, seek hidden spots, and shun the baths. For you may win the reward and title of a poet, if you never put into the hands of Licinus, the barber, the head that three Antiseras could not heal. Fool that I am, I purge myself of choler when spring comes on. Were it not so, no man had been a better poet, but no matter. Let me then serve as a whetstone, which, though it have no part or lot in cutting, can still make steel sharp. Though writing not myself, I will teach the function and duty of a writer, whence he gets his supplies, what feeds and shapes him, what he should do and what not, whither excellence and whither error leads. Of writing, the beginning and source is sound knowledge, and the subject the Socratic leaves will show you. That provided for, the words will readily follow. He who has learned what is owing to country and friends, with what love a parent, with what love a friend or brother, is to be loved, what is the duty of a senator, what of a judge, and what the part of a leader sent upon campaign, it is just he who knows how to bestow the fitting attributes on every character. I would bid my learned imitator look to the model given by life and manners, and thence draw living utterances. Often a play with striking general truths and characters well drawn, though it possess no beauty and be without weighty or artistic language, pleases the audience and holds them better than verses which lack subject or than melodious trifles. To the Greeks the muse gave genius and rounded utterance, for they cared for naught but glory. The youth of Rome learned by long reckonings to divide the ace into a hundred parts. Answer, Albinus' son, take away one twelfth from five twelfths, and what is over? You might have answered by now. A third. Well done, you will be able to keep your property. Add a twelfth, and what's the answer? A half. When this rust and care for money has once infected the mind, do we hope that poems can be written which are worthy to be smeared with setter oil or capped in polished cypress? Poets seek either to profit or to delight or to say what shall be pleasing, and at the same time helpful in our lives. Whatever counsel you give, be short, that what is quickly said the mind may quickly catch, and learn, and retain faithfully. No mere verbiage will stay in the burdened memory. That which is devised for entertainment's sake must be as near as may be to the truth. The story must not demand that whatever it likes be believed, or bring forth a live child from the maw of gorged Lamia. The centuries of seniors will cast aside poems that serve no useful end. The rumness will haughtily pass by those that are severe. But every vote is carried by the man who mingles pleasure and profit, by delighting the reader, and teaching too. This is the book that will make money for the sociae. This the book that will cross the sea and make its author known, winning for him long life. But there are faults we could wish to pardon for the string gives not ever the note that hand and thought require, but often when the player asks for a low note, answers with a high, nor always will the bow strike all that it threatens. But where much in a poem is bright, I am not one to take offence at the few spots which want of care scattered on the work, or human frailty overlooked. Where then lies the point? As a copyist, if he still makes the same mistake though warned, is not excused, as a harpist who always goes wrong on the same string becomes a laughing stock, so with me a writer who is often out becomes like querulous, at whom, if once or twice he reaches excellence, I wonder with a smile. Yet I am angry too when noble Homer nods, but in so long a work it was but right that slumber should steal upon him. As in painting, so in poetry, one work will take your fancy if you stand close to it, another if you stand far off. This loves dimness, and that would be seen in the light, and does not shrink from the critic's keen judgment. This pleased us only once, that, seen ten times over, will please. 
O elder of the youths, although by a father's voice you are molded to wisdom and have judgment of your own, take to yourself the same, and remember that, in certain things, that which is middling and will pass is rightly tolerated. A middling attorney or barrister is far below the excellence of eloquent Messala, and does not know as much as Aulus Caselius, and yet he is esteemed. But that poets should be middling is tolerated neither by men nor by gods nor by shop windows. As at a pleasant banquet discordant music, or thick ointment, or poppy seed with Sardinian honey is an offence, because the dinner could have dispensed with them, so poetry that was born and devised to please, if it fall but little short of the best, comes near the worst. He who cannot play lets alone the weapons of the training ground, and unskilled to use the ball or the disc or the hoop keeps quiet, lest the encircling crowd raise a laugh, and he have naught to say. Yet the man who knows nothing of verses still dares to write them. Why not? He is freeborn and a gentleman. Nay, he is rated as owning a knight's property, and has every virtue. But you will never do or say aught against Minerva's wish, such is your judgment, such your purpose. Still, if you ever write a work, let it come before the critical ear of Mycius, before your father's and mine. Let it be kept back nine years, the parchment laid aside. Unpublished works can be destroyed. The word once uttered can never be recalled. Woodland men were turned from slaughter and from savage food by holy Orpheus, the prophet of heaven, and therefore he is said to have charmed tigers and raging lions. Tis said, too, that Amphion, the founder of the Theban city, moved rocks by the sound of his flute, and by his sweet appeal led them whither he would. Herein once was wisdom, to distinguish what was the states and what the citizens, what sacred and what profane, to check promiscuous intercourse and give right to husbands, to found cities and inscribe laws upon wood. Thus reverence and fame were the reward of heavenly seers and song. After their days, Homer won fame, and Tertius, by his verse, wetted heroic souls for martial wars. Oracles were given in song, and the way of life made plain. Men strove by Pyrian music to win the favor of kings, and found out festivals to be the end of long labors, lest you feel shame for the muse skilled in the lyre, and Apollo the god of song. It has been asked if a noble poem is made by nature or art. For my part, I cannot see what profit there is in study without a rich vein of genius, or in genius untrained. So much does the one require the other's aid, and so friendly is their conspiracy. He who would fain reach the hoped-for goal has done and suffered much in boyhood, has sweated and felt cold, has kept himself from love and wine. The flute-player who plays at the Pythian games has first learned his art and dreaded a master. Today it is enough to say, I compose marvelous poems, devil take the hindmost. For me it is a shame if I am left behind, and if I admit that I know frankly nothing of what I never learned. Like an auctioneer who gathers a crowd to buy his goods, a poet who is rich in lands and rich in money put out at interest, bids flatterers come for gain. Moreover, if he is one who knows well how to set on a dainty meal, and can go bail for the poor man who has no credit, and rescue one who is entangled in the fatal meshes of litigation, I shall be surprised if, fortunate as he is, he can distinguish a liar from a true friend. If you have made a present, or wish to make one to any man, do not, when he is in the fullness of his joy, bring him to hear the verses you have made, for he will cry, Beautiful! Good! Right! He will grow pale at some, nay more. He will let fall the dew from sympathetic eyes. He will dance and beat the ground with his foot. As hired mourners at a funeral do, and say almost more than those who grieve from their hearts, the flatterer is more moved than a sincere admirer. Kings, tis said, are wont to ply with many cups, and rack with wine, the man whose worthiness to be a friend they labor to test. If you build poems, you will never be deceived by the spirit that lurks in the fox. If you ever read a poem to Quintilius, he would say, I would have you mend this and this. If you asserted you could do no better, and had tried twice or three times in vain, he would bid you destroy the ill-turned lines, or send them back to the anvil. 
If you chose rather to defend than to change a fault, not another word, nor further useless pains would he bestow to save you from becoming the lover of yourself and your own works alone and without a rival. A man who is sincere and wise will condemn wreck lines and blame harsh, and with a cross stroke of his pen will set a black mark against such as are inartistic, pretentious ornament. He will cut out and will force obscure verses to give light, convict a double meaning, and note what must be changed. He will be an Aristarchus, and will not say, Why should I quarrel with a friend about trifles? These trifles lead to grave ills, when once a writer has been fooled and treated insincerely. Wise men fear to touch a frenzied poet, and shun him as they do a man afflicted by the pest of scurvy or the royal disease, by frantic delusion or Diana's wrath, while boys tease him and rashly follow him. Should such a one, while belching forth verses head in air and strain about, fall, like a bird-catcher intent on blackbirds, into a well or pit, he might shout aloud, Help, fellow citizens! But there would be none who cared to pull him out. If any cared to bring him aid and let down a rope, how do you know, I should say, whether he did not throw himself down here on purpose and does not want to be saved? And I shall tell of the death of the Sicilian poet. In his desire to be thought an immortal god, Empedocles, in cold blood, leapt into burning Etna. Let poets have the right and be allowed to perish. To save a man against his will is the same as to kill him. Tis not the first time he has done this and if he is dragged back, he will not now become a sane man and put aside his desire for a distinguished death. Nor is there reason apparent why he keeps making verses, whether he defiled his father's ashes, or godlessly touched an ill-owned spot blasted by lightning, tis certain he is infuriated, and like a bear that has managed to burst the confining bars of its cage, he scatters, learned and unlearned alike, with his insufferable recitations. The man he seizes, he holds and murders by his reading, a leech that will not let go the skin till he is full of blood. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Art of Poetry by Quintus Oratius Flaccus Translated by Andrew Wood Read for LibriVox.org by Linny Part 1 The Art of Poetry to the pieces. If to a human head a painter choose to join a horse's neck, and then should use limbs from all quarters gathered, them invest with varied plumage drawn from many a nest, so that above a lovely maid he'd show, but ending in a hideous fish below, could you, my friends, from ridicule refrain when called to view a thing so strange, so vain? In such a work, Pisos, to me it seems, a book of fancies wrought like sick men's dreams resembles greatly, for from first to last not in one mould the thoughts and words are cast. Painters, you say, and poets for their task, have had such license fair as they may ask. Such license is legitimate, we know. In turn we seek and give it, but not so, that mild and cruel may stand tete-a-tete, -tete that snakes with birds, tigers with lambs may mate. To pompous introductions, even such, as seem to us at first to promise much, oft here and there there stacked some purple patch, which by its luster bright the eye may catch, when Dian's grove and altar they portray, and the meandering streams as on their way, through pleasant fields they rush, the river Rhine, the watery bough, they're out of place, though fine. I well a cypress can depict, say you, but what of that if you've to paint a view for a price paid, where a man hopelessly swims from a wreck athwart a stormy sea? Why should we what a jar had been designed, as the wheel turns a sorry pitcher find? But, in a word, whate'er your subject be, let it have oneness and simplicity. O oh, sire, sons worthy of that sire, believe, Appearances of right most bards deceive. If brevity I labor to secure, Then this results my lines become obscure. In striving after smoothness it may be, I fail in spirit and in energy. Say that my lines in lofty strain I cast, The chances are I'm landed in bombast. 
He who over cautious dreads the tempest's sound is apt to crouch and creep along the ground. He who one theme would vary monstrously, dolphins in woods depicts, boars in the sea. But from a fault to fly through want of skill may haply lead to error greater still. An artist near the Emilian school who lives in style unique to nails expression gives. Well, too, soft hair in bronze he'll imitate. Yet, in the end, to an unhappy fate, his work may come because proportion meet he fails to give, nor makes the whole complete. Then be like such a one, should I compose, I'd rather be distinguished by a nose which draws attention by its ugliness, while fine black eyes and hair I might possess. That you should choose a subject, you who write, that suited to your strength is proper quite. Write, too, that you should ponder long with care what your powers can and what they cannot bear. Him who has chosen what his strength avails, nor eloquence nor lucid order fails. Unless I greatly err and speak amiss, the beauty and the worth of orders this, that it will say just now, without delay, exactly what just now it ought to say, that many things twill to the fur thing fit, and for the present many things omit, that of a promised work the author will this part prefer, and that reject with skill. Nice, too, and cautious in the words you use. Well, you'll succeed, if you should introduce, by skillful combination, some new phrase, which may from henceforth take a noted place. If haply to describe it needful be, subjects abstruse by words coined recently, these words to fashion were compelled, I own, which to high girt Sethegy were unknown. And license will be given as needs occasion, but license it must be in moderation. New words, and words but recently contrived, will credit have, if they should be derived, from a Greek root, with small degree of change. What, truly, shall a Roman grant arrange to Plautus and Sicilius, which in vain Virgil and Varius may hope to gain? Shall there be grudge to me a boon not great, if I a few new phrases can create, since Aeneas and Cato's conversation enriched the language of the Roman nation, and new words introduced? None will refuse, nor have refused words sealed by present use. As in the woods, with each declining year, the old leaves fall, those first which first appear, so likewise words grown old decay and die, while newborn words like youth bloom vigorously. Ourselves and all we have for death are cast, whether the poor, which from the north winds blast our fleet protects, a royal work, or what was once not, but a sterile marshy flat, on which in boats one then might row, which now feeds neighboring towns and bears the heavy plough. Or Tiber wants to crops with mischief fraught, but which a better course has now been taught. If these and all the works of men must wane, say, shall the force and grace of words remain? But many words which now are obsolete may yet revive, and some which now we treat with honor shall go down, if custom will custom, the judge, law, rule of language still. T'was Homer first who taught us in what verse sad wars, kings, leaders' actions to rehearse. Alternate lines for plaintive moods devised, joyful emotions afterwards comprised. But who first used short elegiac strains, grammarians fight, a moot point it remains. T'was with his own iambics wrath supplied, Archilochus, that measure has been tried, both by our comic writers and by those who court the tragic muse, that foot they chose, because their dialogue it suited well, as calculated to the noise to quell of an excited audience, and as prone the action of the stage to hurry on. The gods, their offspring the heroic race, the athlete who has gained the victor's place, the winning horse, the youthful lover's size, of rosy wine the jovial draughts likewise, all these to celebrate the tuneful nine, the grateful duty to the lyre assign. Why am I greeted as a poet now, if I'm unable, if I know not how, with chains marked of style and coloring, the varied themes of poetry to sing? Why should I choose, led by false modesty, rather than learn, still ignorant to be? 
A comic subject loathes a tragic strain. The banquet of Aestes will disdain familiar phrases which deep feeling mock, and which are worthy only of the sock. Then let each kind of verse its proper place assume, and hold it with becoming grace. Yet comedy sometimes her tone will raise, and angry creams rails in swelling phrase, the tragic telephus and Peleus moan, oft in prosaic style, when they alone, poor and in exile stand, away they cast, sesquipedalian words full of bombast, if the spectators' hearts to touch they care, while sad complaints before them they lay bare. Mere beauty in a poem won't suffice, it must affect the feelings and entice the minds of those who listen to proceed, whithersoever it may onwards lead. As those who laugh to those who laugh respond, so between weeping mortals there's a bond. If you would have me weep, you must first grieve. Then sympathy your sorrow will receive. Pelias and Telephus, without dispute, I'll sleep or laugh at words that do not suit. Sad words to sad looks are appropriate. Words full of threats become the passionate. Lascivious talk well suits the wanton leer, and serious words accord with the severe. Nature at first to fortune's varied path adapts our minds, she goads us on to wrath, makes us rejoice, or causes us to frown, when she with pain and sorrow weighs us down. But after, for the mind's emotions strong, she makes us find expression through the tongue. If a man's talk accords not with his station, both knights and mob for laughter find occasion. A difference great there will be then perforce, whether a hero or a god discourse. The man who to his ears ripe judgment owes, or he in whose young veins the hot blood flows, the nurse of fishes or the merchant stayed, the merchant who long voyages has made, or he who tills the ground, the Colchian, the Argive, Theban or Assyrian. Follow tradition's lead, or be content, persons consistent with themselves to invent. If of renowned Achilles you would tell, let him be active and implacable. Let him be wrathful and impetuously, that laws were made for him with oaths deny. And to his arms, all married arrogate, Medea should be fierce, unbent by fate. Ixion treacherous, I know lacrimose, Io a waif, Orestes crushed with woes. If to the stage a theme as yet untried, you venture to commit, if you decide, a character that's new to broach, be sure that to the last that character endure, as from the first it started, and shall be born with itself throughout consistently. Tis difficult to treat a common theme, so that one's own it properly may seem. Suppose the Iliad you should dramatize. You'd on a course adventure much more wise than should you be the first to make your own subjects as yet unsung, as yet unknown. But public themes private by right you make, if no slow course of commonplace you take. If slavish rendering word by word you shun, not as an imitator headlong run, into a strait from whence your modesty, or laws of verse forbid you to get free. Don't, like the cyclic bard of old, begin. I'll sing of Priam's fate and Ward's loud den. What yields the boaster who thus blows his horn? The mountain's labor, and a mouse is born. More rightly acts the bard who not essays, in such unskillful fashion when he says, Sing news, the man who after Troy's dire fate, the habits swatched in towns of many state. With him no smoke succeeds to flesh's bright, but out of smoke he aims at causing light, that he his striking marvels forth may bring, such as Antipathies, the giant king, Scylla, Charybdis, and the Cyclops, why? Nor Diomedes return does he indite, starting from Meleager's death, nor date from the twin eggs, the Trojan war so great. He's hastening ever to the denouement, into the middle of events along. His auditors he hurries as if they were well acquainted with them ere that day. Things which poetic treatment is not fit to render striking, these he will omit. And so he moulds his fiction, and so blends what's false with what is true to suit his ends, that twixt beginning, middle, and may be, observe no traces of discrepancy. 
what I and what the people wish now here, if you admirers fain would have sincere, who will sit on until the curtains rise, and to applaud ye all, the player cries. Note well all ages' habits as they live, to varying ears and dispositions give, the character which they should each receive. Mark first the boy who just has learned to talk, and with a steady foot alone to walk with those of his own age in gambles ranging, soon angry, calmed as soon, with each hour changing. The beardless youth, released from tutor's claims, delights in horses, dogs, and campus games. Plastic as walks in being bent to vice, churlish to those who tender him advice, slow in providing what may prove of use, yet of his money lavishly profuse. Haughty, ambitious, readily he's moved, that to resign which he but lately loved. His views now changed, his manly eye and mine, seek wealth and friendships, honor strive to find. He's careful, lest himself he should commit, to things which soon to change he may see fit. Discomforts many the old man surround, either because he seeks what went is found, and hoards up wretchedly, or that all business with timidity and coldness he transacts, procrastinates, through long vista hopes, inactive waits. Thirsts for long life, is peevish and morose, In praise of his young days, is prone to prose. Blame of his juniors he will oft express, And chide their actions with censoriousness. Years as they come bring comforts in their train, Years as they go take them away again. Assign not to a youth an old man's spark, Nor let a boy possess a grown man's heart. To every stage of life be sure you give, The proper adjuncts which each should receive. Upon the stage the facts are either shown, or they are reported as already done. Things by the ear receive men's minds excite, much less than when submitted to the sight. For the spectator with his trusty eyes to his own mind impressions best applies. Yet you'll avoid to bring upon the scene things worthy only to be done within, and which in vivid words appropriate, one who had witnessed them can well relate. Let not Medea decency affright, and kill her offspring in the people's sight. And let not Atreus in his wicked rage, human intestines cook upon the stage. Display not Procnus turned into a bird, nor Cadmus to a snake, both scenes absurd. Whatever things like this you show to me, I hate and view with incredulity. A play should have five acts, nor less nor more, to be in vogue and acted o'er and o'er. The aid invoke not of a deity, unless a not worthy a god there be. Let no fourth person on the stage intrude, to mar the dialogue, but it is good. The chorus should sustain the actor's art, and vigorous action to the play in part. But twixt the acts it should not utter aught, that's not connected with, nor helps the plot. Let it support the good, with counsel aid. The angry rule, love those to sin afraid. Let it to frugal tables yield applause. Let it advise sound and impartial laws. Let it with justice strict imbued the states, and to them peace command with open gates. Let it conceal all secret things that may to it committed be, and let it pray, and supplicate the gods good luck to make, visit the wretched and the proud forsake. The olden flute, not then, as now tis found, jointed with brass, reveling the trumpet sound, but slender, with few stops, and simply made, served well the chorus to sustain and aid, and with its tones the theatre, which still was not close crammed sufficiently to fill. There flocked the people, countable though small, their number, frugal, modest, chaste withal. When they victorious add to their domains, and when a wider wall their towns contains, when noonday draughts of wine, free as they please, and holidays the genius appease, then, with more license, rhythm, and time unite, to help the players and the crowd delight. Yet what of taste could the rude rustic know, with it polite mixed up, noble with low? Thus the musician tended to impart movements luxurious to the ancient art, and up and down the stage with measured tread, behind him dragged the robe with train outspread. Notes, too, were added to the solemn lyre, and the bard's words, impetuous, full of fire, a style of dialect then introduced, which ne'er before upon the stage was used, as to the things present shrewd the sentiment, 
and as to things to come so prescient, I would bear in truth comparison full well with any vaunted Delphic oracle. The poet who a tragic drama wrote, in competition for a vile he goat, soon after rustic satires naked too, brought on the stage, it was a rough jest his view, was, saving tragedy's severity, to lure and keep with grateful novelty, him who, his sacred duties duly done, drunk to the playhouse came for roistering fun. When merry witty satires thus you choose, into a tragedy to introduce, and to convert things serious into jest, then he who played a god or hero dressed, lately in robes of purple mixed with gold, should not, by using language low, make bold to pass into mean taverns, nor take fights, shutting the ground to clouds and empty heights. But tragedy, who hates like prattling phrase, like matron bid to dance on holidays, will mingle with those satires spurred and free, with some reserve and bashful modesty. But should I write satiric plays, I choose, not plain and literal words alone to use, nor from the tragic style so deviate that it would matter not if Davis prayed, and the bold Pythia, when from Simo she extracts his cash by errant roguery, or rather speak Silenus, grave but free, who guards and serves his foster deity. End of part one. This recording is in the public domain. The Art of Poetry by Quintus Horatius Flaccus Translated by Andrew Wood Read for LibriVox.org by Lenny Part 2 From a known theme I'd sow my poem frame, That each might hope that he could do the same. But, having struggled hard with toil and pain, He'd find at last that he had worked in vain. So much of veil lines well arranged and knit, And common subjects so much grace admit, Fawns from the forests brought, for so I ween, should not, as if in cities bred it been, and trained to business in the market-place, converse in mincing namby-pamby phrase, or belch forth words improper and obscene, and language born of slaughter and of spleen. Patricians, knights, and men of fortune hate such things as these, nor can they tolerate, nor with approval crown the things which please that class who buy roast chestnuts and chickpeas. When a long syllable succeeds a short, that's an iambus, measure of swift sort. Whence also it of trimeters the name, cave to iambics when six beats the same, from first to last it had, not long ago, that it might yield a sound more grave and slow, contentedly it took, writing to please, within its own domain the state's pandies. But not to quit the second or fourth place, did it as comrades kindly these embrace. Rarely we find this compound kind of verse in Osseus' famed and noble trimeters. Judgment severe on Aeneas must be passed, because upon the stage he verses cast, ponderous with spondees, which betoked haste, or want of care, of knowledge, or of taste. It is not every critic who can see in lines the want of tuneful harmony, and Roman poets have indulgence got, which they undoubtedly deserved have not. Should I then ramble and write lawlessly? Or should I, thinking all my faults will see, safe within pardon's bounds my self-preserve, that were but blame to shun, not praise deserve? Ply Grecian models, my friends, Pizzle, pray, with care them study both by night and day. Your ancestors, you say, thought fit to praise the wit and numbers of old Plautus plays. Yes, one and the other, they too patiently, we may say foolishly admired if we how to distinguish wit from coarseness know, and can by beating time true cadence show. Thespis invented tragedy, he said, before unknown, in wagons he conveyed, those who to sing and act his plays appeared, having with lees of wine their faces smeared. And next came Aeschylus, the mask who used, and the grand flowing robe first introduced. The stage with planks of moderate size he led, taught lofty uterance in the buskin strad. To these succeeded the old comedy, worthy of no small praise, yet liberty to license ran, and into violence, needing to be restrained by law, and hence, when the law passed, the power of Muskeef o'er, to its disgrace, the chorus spoke no more. 
our poets tried at everything their hand, for this our special praise they may command, because they dared Greek subjects to eschew, and from domestic facts their themes they drew. Whether they wrote in tragic high-toned strain, or humbler, plainer, low-toned comic vein. Nor less renowned in letters would Rome be, than by her glorious arms and bravery, if twere not that her poets, every one, time slaps and the foul's work were prone to shun. O Pisos, sprung from Numa's blood direct, with censor view a work which to correct, by toil of many a day and many a blot, a bard has grudged, which he has treated not, with castigation tenfold, till it be changed and amended to a nicety. Because that sage Democritus pretends that genius wretched study far transcends, because St. Bards from Helicon hit bar, it comes that many poets slow ones are. Neglect their nails to pair, their beards to trim, avoid their bath, retirement seek through whim. For he, forsooth, it seems made rightly claim, a poet's guerdon and a poet's name. If never he his head submitted has, incurable by three enticerous, to barber listeners, O oh, stupid I, who, when the time of swing approaches, try, by purgatives my bile to put to flight, who but for this could better poems write? Tis no great matter, therefore let me play the greenstone spark, which iron sharp may, yet of itself for cutting is unfit. I'll nothing write myself, but in submit, to those who do, such rules as may write, teach them their duties and their functions quite. Teach them where their resources they may find, what forms, what nourishes the poet's mind. Teach twixt and fit and fit the difference, whither leads error, whither excellence. Good sense of writing well is found and source, the matter you'll best find if you've recourse to the Socratic words, your theme well con, the words with readiness will follow on. He who has learned what to his friends he owes, what to his country, he who rightly knows how one should love a parent, brother, guest, who understands the functions which invest the office of a judge or senator, the part of one as general sent to war, he should be skilled in that without dispute, his language to each character to suit. The skillful imitator, I would tell, of life and morals ever to mark well, the living models that with living fire the language of his works they may inspire. Sometimes a play which wants skill, weight, and grace, because tis rich in telling commonplace, and varied characters exemplifies, proves more attractive in the people's eyes. Their interest, too, it longer keeps than place, lacking in incidents, mere jingling lays. Unto the Greeks who covet not but praise, the muse has genius given, and polished phrase. But as for Roman boys, tis their concern, by calculations tedious to learn, and as into a hundred parts to share, suppose one asks Albina's son, whene'er you from five ounces take one ounce away, what's left? You used to know. Four, he will say. Good, you rejoin. Well will you guard your store. But if there should be added one ounce more, say, what would be your calculation then? The sum will be six ounces, that is plain. If wealth's corrosion and anxiety shall thus possess men's minds, how should it be? that one can hope that poems can be read, worthy that we their custody commit, when once with setter oil they've been imbued, to boxes wrought of polished cypress wood. The bard seeks either to instruct or please, or he attempts to gather both of these, to compass and combine what pleasure gives with what will tend to guide man as he lives. If precepts you'd impart, use brevity, so that the docile mind may quickly see, what you would teach, it faithfully retain. From a full mind, all words superfluous drain. Fiction that's meant to please should ever be as near as may be to reality. Nor should a play credence entire receive for whatsoever it asks one to believe. For instance, from a well-fed Lamia's maw, it would never do a living boy to draw. Grave seniors uninstructive plays will spurn. On plays austere, proud knights their backs will turn. He who the useful and agreeable in happy harmony has mingled well, and in one breath delight and warning gives, a general vote of gratitude receives. A work like this merits the saucy's pay, 
to lands across the sea it finds its way, and down the stream of time, wafted by fame, to distant ages bears its author's name. Yet there are faults which one would fain excuse, not aid a tone which hand and mind would choose, gives the string forth, for not unfrequently, when we require a flat, a sharp twill be. Nor always will the arrow from the bow strike where the archer meant that it should go. When in a poem beauties much abound, why should we chide if a few stains be found, which have crept in through want of proper care, or of which human nature can't be weary? What shall we say? If a transcriber make, although we've warned him off, the same mistake, he's not excused. We laugh at a harp player, should he upon the same string always err. And so the bard, whose faults are numerous, seems to me like that stupid querulous, whom, if he on a few occasions shine, to wonder and to laugh at I incline. And I the same somewhat annoyed may feel, if o'er good hummer sleep at times should steal. To one who writes a lengthened work, indeed, rightly we may to snatch a nap concede. With poems, as with paintings, tis the case, that some please more when viewed from a near place, whereas to others, if you justice do, them at a distance you are bound to view. Some court the shade, some love the sunlight's blaze, nor holding dread the critic's keenest gaze. Some please for once, and then to please they cease, others, ten times repeated, still will please. O thou the elder of the piso youth, though by the father's voice thou art formed to truth, and of thyself art wise, yet what I say, take up, and in thy memory let it stay, that in some things allowable may be, mere average worth and mediocrity, one who has no great knowledge of the laws, and who can only fairly plead a cause, far from a solace excellence may be, in eloquence, nor as much law knows he, as does Cassilius Aulus, that's quite true. And yet that man has his own value too, but mediocre bards, nor gods, I vow, nor men, nor booksellers will e'er allow. Meets pleasant feasts sometimes to make us sick, in true discordant music, unguent thick, and bitter poppy conserves which are made with honey from Sardinia conveyed, because the supper might with these dispense, the greater to the guests is the offence. And so a poem which a bard indites, the offspring of his brain, to yield the lights, if from the top a little it descend, down to the bottom is too apt to tend. One who his strength in games has ne'er employed, the struggles of the campus will avoid. He who of ball who quite knows not the use, will rest in quiet and to play refuse, lest of surrounding bystanders the crowd should mock his efforts with derision loud. Yet... He who knows the verse not a jot, will dare to fashion poems, and why not? He's free, well born, has fortune may suffice to constitute a knight, void of all vice. But you, such is your judgment, such your mind, will not what's wrong to wisdom's prompting blind, or say, or do. If ever you should write, the critic Messias' judgment you'll invite, your father's too, and mine, your manuscript, for nine long years should in your desk be kept. What you've not published you may change or burn. A word once uttered never can return. Orpheus, of God's priest and interpreter, the savage race of mankind to deter from murder and from victuals foul prevailed. On this account, t'was said, he never failed, by softening influences to assuage the tiger's and the rabid lion's rage. And Fiam too, who built the Theban towers, his harp and winning voice employed as powers to move the stony rock from out its bed and lead it at his pleasure, so tis said. For this was wisdom judged in days of old, public from private things distinct to hold, things sacred from profane to separate, to check light love and rule the married state. Towns fortified to build was then thought good, and to inscribe the code of laws on wood. And thus distinction and a glorious name to bards divine and to their poems came. Great Homer and Tertius next appeared. They in their works men's manly bosoms cheered, and proudly spurred them on to fields of fight. Poems were used to bring men's fates to light. By them the proper path of life was taught, and in Pyrian strains kings' favor sought. 
sports were found out, and the hard work to cheer, birth served, their labor or to crown the year. To worship Phoebus, god of poetry, and lyric muse ashamed you need not be. We know another question has been raised, whether a poem worthy to be praised owes more to nature or owes more to art. I must confess, I see not, for my part, how study without genius can succeed, and how untutored genius well can speed. Each from the other seems to ask its aid. As friends united they stand undismayed. Him in the race who'd reached the winning post, endurance much and toil it must have cost. When young he must both cold and heat have braved, himself from love and wine's enticement saved. The harpist at the Pythian games would play must first have learned and felt a master's sway. Nor tis enough a poet should exclaim, I wondrous poems write which gild my name. Play take the hindmost, where a great disgrace, if I were left behind hand in the race, and to confess, were it forsooth my lot, that I don't know that which I ne'er was taught. An auction crier to collect a crowd, his wares to buy puffs them in accents loud. Even so a poet, who's of land possessed, rich too in cash laid out at interest, his gold distributing with liberal hand, is sure the praise of flatterers to commend. And, if he's one who can a dinner give, in handsome style, or a poor man relieve, who, credit gone, needs good security, and from vexatious lawsuits set him free, though blessed he be, I'd wonder if he knew, a false friend to distinguish from a true. Should you have made, or should you mean to make, to any one a present, don't him take, replete with joy, to judge your poetry. He'll cry out, Bravo, lovely, good, ah, me! Then he'll grow pale, and next there will appear, in his moist eye like dew the friendly tear. He'll dance and jump about like one inspired, as at a funeral the mourners hired by voice and action play a stronger part than friends and relatives who mourn at heart. So will the flatterer far more move the peer than he whose approbation is sincere. They say that kings with many wine-cups ply, and thus extort from him whom they would spy, whether it be the case or no that be, a favoured and a friendship worthy be. If you'll write poetry, be sure you'll need of cunning fox-like flatterers to take heed. If to Quintilius you should aught recite, he'll say, I pray you this and that, put right. If that you can't do better, you maintain, for you have tried it twice or thrice in vain, he'd bid you then the faults delete or burn, and to the anvil ill-wrought lines return. But if these faults you rather would defend, than take the pains to alter and amend, he not a word would add, nor further try, for then he knows he'll fail most certainly to bulk your notion that your works and you, you fondly may as quite unrivaled view. An honest, skilful critic will find fault with languid lines, and those erase which halt. Lines that are rough he'll blame, and tropes ornate from the ambitious lines he'll amputate. For the obscure more light he'll recommend, and the ambiguous he will reprehend. About things requiring change he'll not be dumb. A second Aristarchus he'll become. Nor will he say, Wherefore should I offend in matters which but trifles are a friend? Tis by such trifles mischief is in jail, on those who've once midst public laughter failed. The wise with a mad poet contact fear, and fly incontinent if he come near, as from one with the itch or jaundice sick, the fury stricken or the lunatic. Him children of the pavement chase and hoot, and foolish adults join in the pursuit. While spouting verses he at random strays, his head erect as at the sky he'd gaze, if like a fowler keenly occupied, in sneering blackbirds he perchance should slide into a ditch or well, though long he cried, Help! Help! O citizens! Yet none will hide, to pull him out, or if there one should be, inclined to help him out for charity, and to let down a rope, to him I'll say, how know you but the man on purpose may himself have brought into this sorry plight, and would not have you save him, if you might? This to illustrate I would then relate the bard of Sicily's untimely fate, that fool in Pedocles who madly sought to be a deity mortal thought, and with sang for cool himself he kept, into the burning fire of Edna leapt. 
give poets right and leave to perish still to save them guess their wish is them to kill nor only once has he done this for he though you should rescue him will never be a reasonable man nor cease to sigh from the desire of famous death to die why it is doomed that from his pen should flow a constant stream of verse we scarcely know did he his father's grave with insult treat or has he trod with sacrilegious feet the sad by dentos presence one thing's clear he's mad and like a bear in his career if it have broke the gradients of its den the merciless rehearser worries then learned and unlearned and if he should succeed in catching one him he to death will read just like a leech which to one's skin sticks fast nor quits its hole to gorge with blood at last End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Carbon Psycholare by Quintus Oratius Flacus. Read for LibriVox.org by Leni. Foibe silvarumque potens diana, lucidum caeli decus o colendi, semper et culti. Date quae precamur tempore sacro quo sibilini unuere versus virgines lectas puerosque castos dis quibus septem placuere colles dicere carmen alme sol curu nitido diem qui promiset celas aliusque tidem nasceris postis nihil urbe roma visere maius Dite maturos a perire partus lenis ilithia. Tuere matres, si vetulucina probas vocaris seu genitalis, diva produca subolem patrunque prosperes, decreta super iugandis feminis prolisque novae feraci lege marita. Certus un de nos de quiens per anos orbis ut cantus referatque ludos terdie claro totiensque grata nocte frequentis vosque veraces que quinise parcae quod semel dicte stabilisque rerum terminus servet bona iam per actis jungite fata fertilis frugum Pecorisque tellus, spice ad onet, quererem corona, nutriant fetus, et a quae salubres et uis aurae. Condito mitis placidusque tello, supplices audi pueros Apollo, siderum regina bicornis, audi, luna puelas. Roma si vestrest, opus iliaeque, litus etruscum, Tenuere turmai, ius apars mutare lares et urbem, sospite cursu, cui per ardentem sine fraude troiam, castus aeneas, patriae superstes, liberum munivi, iter daturus, plura relictis, di, probos mores, docili juventae, di, senec tutti placidae quietem, romulae genti, dateremque prolem quid decus omne. Quaeque vos bobus veneratur albis, clarus anchisae venerisque sanguis, impetre belante prior, iacentem, lenis in hostem. Iam maritera que manus potentis, medus alba nasque timet securis, Iam scithae responsa petum superbi, nupere tindi. Iam fides et pax et honos pudorque, priscus et neglecta redire virtus, audet ad paretque beata pleno, copia corno. Augur et fulgente de corus arcu, foibus a ceptusque novem camenis, qui salutari levat artefessos corporis artus, si palatinas videt aequos aras, remque romanam latiumque felix, alter in lustrum meliusque semper prorogataevum, 
quae qua venti num tenet algi dunque quinde quim diana preces virorum cura de tuotis fuerora micas adlicat auris haec iovem sentire de osque cuntos spem bonam certam quedomum reporto doctus et foebi corus et dianae dicere laudes end of poem this recording is in the public domain Carmen Saeculare by Quintus Oratius Flaccus Translated by John Connington Read for LibriVox.org by Lini Phoebus and Diana, Huntress Fair, Today and always magnified, Bright lights of heaven, accord our prayer, This holy tide, On which the Sibyl's volume wills, That youths and maidens without stain, To gods who love the seven dear hills, Should chant the strain. Sun, that unchanged yet ever new, Leads out the way and brings it home, May not be present to thy view More great than Rome. Blessed Elithia, be thou near, In travail to each Roman dame. Lucina, genitalis here, Whatever thy name. O make our youth to live and grow, The father's nuptial counsel speed, Those laws that shall on Rome bestow A plenteous seed. So when a hundred years and ten bring round the cycle, game and song, three days, three nights, shall charm again the festal throng. Ye too, ye fates, whose righteous doom declared but once is sure as heaven, link on new blessings yet to come to blessings given. Let earth with grain and cattle rife, crown Sirius brow with bread and corn, soft winds, sweet waters, nurse to life the newly born. O lay thy shafts, Apollo, by, Let suppliant youths obtain thine ear, Thou moon, fair regent of the sky, Thy maidens hear. If Rome is yours, if Troy's remains, Safe by your conduct, sought and found Another city, other fanes, on Tuscan ground, For whom mid fires and piles of slain, Aeneas made a broad highway, Destined, pure heart, with greater gain, Their loss to pay. Grant to our sons unblemished ways, Grant to our sires an age of peace, Grant to our nation power and praise, And large in creeds. See, at your shrine with victims white, Praise Venus and Anchises' hair, O prompt him still the foe to smite, The fallen to spare. Now media dreads our Alban steel, Our victories land and ocean o'er, Scythia and end in suppliance kneel so proud before. Faith, honor, ancient modesty, and peace and virtue, spite of scorn, come back to earth, and plenty see with teeming horn. Augur and lord of silver bow, Apollo, darling of the nine, who heals our frame when languors slow have made it pine. Lovest thou thine own palatial hill, prolong the glorious life of Rome, to other cycles brightening still through time to come. From Algidus and Aventine, List, goddess, to our grave fifteen, To praying youths thine ear incline, Diana, queen. Thus Jove and all the gods agree, So trusting wend we home again, Phoebus and Dian singers we, And this our strain. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.